Welcome to E2 Talks. It's a podcast where we chat about the English language landscape, talking about topics relevant to students like you. In this episode, Jay talks to Darren Brooks, who is director at Torrington eLearning Services and quality assessor and instructional designer at NIAS. Darren is an expert in computer assisted language learning. Jay and Darren discuss traditional versus purpose built LMSs for language learning, the strengths and weaknesses of face to face, blended, flipped, and hybrid language courses, the role of the teacher in the language classroom, as well as the challenges that English language learners face, and how technology can help. It is a wide ranging discussion directed at university English language centres, Ellicos English schools. English language teachers, administrators, and savvy students. Enjoy. Hello, Darren. Hello, Jared. <laughs> Welcome to the podcast. Um, so, I met you the other day when you came to E2 Language to audit us as part of NIAS. And um, I always knew you had a background in language learning technology, computer assisted language learning, but then we started talking more deeply about it. And I was sort of, I think you may be the most uh, impressive person I've met when it comes to this topic. Like, you really know your stuff. Do you think that's fair to say? Um, well, I know. I know a bit, um, and <laughs> mainly from my experience and my work with NIAS, because NIAS quality endorses now, so we do an assessment, so we don't uh-huh. actually audit um, anymore. We, we quality endorse. Um, now, that's a good thing because in terms of quality, I'm always looking at uh, the quality and the best practice aspects of a centre's program. So I'm yeah. very, very interested in what is best practice in online learning, yeah. and that that really encompasses, um, you know, uh, talking to students. Uh, so what what do they think is, um, you know, what is giving them uh, the goods to achieve their learning outcomes? And with technology, one of the biggest advantage uh, advantages I'm seeing these days is the um, ability to give students not only speaking practice but confidence in speaking and um, ways to make their pronunciation uh, clearer, more comprehensible to um, the native and non-native speaker context they're going into in their professional and academic lives. Okay, all right. So one of the big misconceptions that I see when we're talking about education technology is the difference between education technology and technology that's purpose-built for language learning. Um, I went to a conference recently and there was a talk about the use of education technology in the language learning classroom, but it was a discussion about education technology in the language learning classroom, not, again, not purpose-built language learning technology for the language classroom. There's a there's a there's a, a, there's a conflict there. There's a there's there's a square peg in a round hole. Do you want to talk a little bit about what that what that problem is and why perhaps language learning technology hasn't been so successful or well known? Um, there's there's a few reasons. The first first one is that um, a, a lot of purpose built solutions um, are often too expensive for right. a small centre to buy into. Mm-hmm. And what tends to happen is, is it will be individual teachers using um, an open access technology that may or may not have been designed for language learning. So they're using it, as you say, like a square peg in a round hole. Mm-hmm. They're, they're using it and adapting it um, to suit the language learning classroom. Having said that, a lot of innovation has come mm, out of that. I wouldn't want yes, to discourage true. individual yes. teachers kind of playing with different technologies um, because a lot of innovation has come out of that and a lot of new methods of teaching has come for the language classroom has come out of that. Um, the purpose-built things that I have seen that do work quite well uh, and these are evolving. I've had a lot of um, experience in my previous roles as e-learning coordinator, um, implementing, like procuring and implementing language laboratories. Mm-hmm. Uh, now those products have um, 
evolved from the old school, you know, you sat in a language lab, you listened to a tape, you recorded it against the tape. So again, it was an older received pronunciation model mm -hmm. for improving your pronunciation. Now those uh, technologies have evolved somewhat to include a lot more peer-to-peer -peer, mm -hmm. uh, interaction with, um, you know, sit in 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 the classroom where everyone's um, logged into the same um, uh, language laboratory, um, uh, language learning suite, um, and this facility for peer-to-peer -peer interaction, the nego negotiation of meaning, mm. uh, the teacher listening in to give just-in-time feedback, mm. um, and then the ability to record that interaction, save it, play it back at a later date uh, for the student to actually record their progress so the teacher can actually say well you think you're not progressing oh let's pull up a recording from six months ago and a recording from yesterday and let's compare um, how you don't realize how much you think you've plateaued but actually if we compare the two recordings you can see how your pronunciation yes. uh, uh, speaking ability has improved over that six month period so there seems to be now language laboratory technology that's evolving in that way uh, peer-to-peer -peer, uh, ability for for teachers to record and use in a in a you know formative way um, that that's one aspect the evolution of language laboratories into more fully digital networked spaces mm. um, the other thing is um, some of the textbook publishers are now working with learning management systems to integrate their textbooks into the learning management on a per user license base. No, sorry, are they doing that? Are they just digitizing their books and creating ebooks or are they creating courseware? They're creating courseware that has some interactivity built into it. And the amount of interactivity you build into that courseware is often um, you know scalable. So you can yes. buy a basic pack pack Pack, package or uh, you know a more advanced package uh, that's becoming more of a thing um, there's a lot of open access um, language well not primarily language learning software but software that can be adapted to language learning that um, learning management systems um, use as LTI learning and teaching um, instruments or something like so that. So little plugins. Aren't yes, plugins. So the more uh, savvy uh, learning management system providers are uh, leveraging off what teachers and students are using, what what they use, what open access tools they are using, um, and integrating those into the learning management system. One that springs to mind is the H5P suite of um, authoring tools, which is very comprehensive and can be adapted very easily to language learning. They have a dictation tool. They have um, the old Pelman matching cards that can be digitized um, for, say, um, antonyms, synonyms, that kind of thing. Sure. So, so a lot of the tools that they have for um, uh, content study for faculty and schools can be easily adapted for language learning. Um, so there seems to be some of that. Um, within uh, the ELT publishers, there, you know, if you buy a course book nowadays, you get the suite of online activities you as well. You still get the CD-ROM? That's probably <laughs> you can get the CD-ROM. And unfortunately, a lot of smaller centers are still, and not just smaller centers, to be fair, larger centers sure. as well are still wedded to uh, CDs and CD-ROMs. Um, I don't see that moving terribly quickly, but I, mm. I I think it will move to more fully digital systems and, and licensing. And, you know, you can see with the Spotify and mm. Apple Music examples, um, it, you know, it is, it is the way to do it now. Uh, you buy a license to access um, sound recordings. You don't yeah. buy the sound recordings. So, yes. But that's taking a long There's time no to wash. Them, there? There's no need to own them. You buy a lot. It's like a digital jukebox. And I think the publishers are slowly moving in that uh, direction yeah. where you buy a digital subscription and you get access to the sound and also other uh, digital content that you used to get on CD-ROM and CD-audio. Right. So the two big problems that I see in technology and language learning is the first one, it's the square peg in the round hole. We're going to, we have to adapt 
um, technology that's not purpose-built for language learning for the language classroom. And as a corollary of that, the other big problem that I see is disparate tools and having to just pull in random stuff from open source this and that and plug it in and basically building, um, as you mentioned, building an LMS. Now, how technical do you have to be to, first of all, build an LMS with open source tools like that? And secondly, are those tools easy to use? Well, this is this is the issue, and this is why a lot of centres don't do it. Yes, is the complexity. Yes, in setting up an LMS and then having uh, staff who know how to use the ancillary tools, the open access tools, and integrate them. Uh, that requires a level of expertise, which is kind of rare. Um, Does you, that mean you need to hire like an IT it, Well, often, IT? often uh, now in my experience, it's great to have someone who is fully an IT person, yep. but also a teacher who is a teacher coordinator or a teacher, senior teacher who has an interest. And that if that person and the IT person works together, yep. uh, it's a marriage made in heaven because yes. the teacher has the passion and the interest and the IT person is a solutions person and can say, well, how about you try this? Or, and, and that's great. In addition to that, the, 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 if the, the centre employs a person like that, that person is more likely to want to be involved in a special interest group like a SIG, an SIG, yep. of other similarly placed ELT professionals where they can discuss. And it's, it's breaking down the silos between centres because often you have people working in isolation, maybe a teacher who has some knowledge or interest, working on their own, mm -hmm. doing really great stuff yep. that another person at another centre who's just starting out could really advan you know, um, advance their career career by getting together with that person. So that's why collaboration yeah. and talking to other people in the industry that are doing the same thing and, you know, even like, oh, what does your IT guy say about that? You know, they yeah. compare their experiences with their support staff. Oh, what's your solution for what works at your centre? Because what works at one centre may not work at another yeah. because they have different systems and whatnot. Um, but that just having that special interest group of like-minded individuals who have the IT support and an interest, and maybe they've done some studies like, um, you know, um, computer-assisted language learning within their master's uh, program, mm. or even postgraduate uh, TESOL programs have yeah. specializations in computer-assisted language learning. But that needs to be developed through a community of practice. You know, it's not a static thing. Oh, I studied call at university and you know, well, that was 10 years ago. That's right. Well, things have moved on dramatically since then. So that person needs that community of practice to, um, you know, not only upgrade, but sustain their knowledge of what's what's working and what students are using, you know, because so many students are fully mobile now. And this is the thing with um, mobile phones, a lot of teachers are uh, scared of them, ask students to turn them off, put them away, confiscate them. But there is scope because students use their mobile phones for everything. They yeah. use it for shopping. They use it for directions, for finding their way, for communicating with their family. The mobile phone is their lifeline. Yeah. Uh, and then for a teacher to say, I'll put it away. It's a distraction. You're only going to use it to you know, do Weibo or something in Chinese in your language. Well, it comes back to classroom management. Yeah. That That's up to you as a teacher and your familiarity with the online apps for, apps for language learning. And I used to always say, okay, well, turn your phones off or put them at the front on my desk. But now we're going to do, I want you to come and get your phone. I want you to scan a QR code or nowadays people use, um, you know, uh, bit.ly, um, what are they called? Tiny URLs yep, and yep, things. Bit, yeah. Yeah. But people are still using QR codes, but they're a bit yeah. old school these yeah, days. But um, uh, what you can do with a mobile phone is that, and it comes back to classroom management, you know, take your, uh, your, your mobile phone out, download the, sound, the, BBC, the Macmillan Sounds of English apps because there's, it's a great app. You can use it outside of the classroom. I'm going to go through the, the sounds today, the long and short vowels. You can see how they're pronounced on the app. Yeah. We can do some little activities where you, you find them and, and, and apply them to our reading activity or whatever we're doing at that point in time. Okay, that activity is over. 
well, put your phones away or put them, you know, sure. it's, it comes back to good classroom management. It's not the technology per se, but it's the way you use it in the classroom and showing the students the value of using their phone for English language learning uh, is, is a, as a learner strategy. Uh, that comes back to good classroom management and the skills of the teacher. So it's it's actually an old, old thing, <laughs> you know, it, teaching students how to use the technology in a meaningful way. It still comes back. If you just leave the phone to the to the to the students and say, oh, there are things out there, go and find them. It's not going to work. You need to actually proactively direct that as the teacher um, and you'll get the more you do it, the more washback you'll get and the more you know, students will realise, oh, I can use my phone or my tablet yeah. as a language learning device. Now, yeah, I, I, yeah, I agree, I agree. And um, I think teachers quite rightly get frustrated with students looking at their phones all the time and whatnot. What about building, what about, okay, this is a bit of a hypothesis, well, not really actually, because this is what we're trying to build at the moment, but imagine a classroom where students sat at a, a workstation um, so, the, or, or a laptop or a tablet in front of them, and the entire curriculum was actually digitized. And so, you know, th there's still room for teaching. The teaching happens, but the activities, the interactive activities, are done on the tablet or on the computer. Um, all the analytics are tracked. All the submissions are sent through the computer to the teacher. So there's no paper. There's no, um, you know, marking marking pieces of paper with red pens. Um, how f you've had a look at Learning Base, the the, mm -hmm. the platform that we're building, or E two School, I should say. What were your what were your um, what did you think of that? Uh, I like the fact that the teachers can customize the learning activities from a suite of tools. Mm. This has been my experience with um, a lot of the online learning I've done. I've always uh, liked or been drawn to products where. There's a degree of customization yeah. that, you know, because there are things that I want to do and learning outcomes that I want to affect in a certain way. And I, I'm always drawn to tools that allow me to do that. Also tools as, as a teacher trainer and a coordinator, tools that can be easily taught. So it, it's no good if you demonstrate something to your colleagues and they fold their arms and say oh that works because you're you're good at IT and I that would I could never do that well to get buy in from your colleagues you have to say well actually it's quite easy to use and yeah. you actually demonstrate the setup and you don't need um, a very sophisticated level of IT skills to affect a really good language learning activity so you have to have a product that um, can easily be manipulated yeah um, that isn't going to take a lot of time because remember the one thing that teachers do not have is lots of yeah, time. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah. any kind of product that can be quickly authored that doesn't – and, and not just quickly authored but quickly taught – yeah. Um, you know, it, yeah. it, and it's not a lot of setup. They don't need to go to the IT guy to make sure it works. No. It, it, it's just plug and play. Plug and play. Yeah. Yes. That that seems to have been my experience with teach, tra teacher training and my own and my own and and the the things I've been drawn to are the things that I can do quickly. I can set them up. You yeah. know, in the in the morning tea break, and then run a lesson. Yeah. You know, um, straight away. It doesn't. There's not a lot of setup. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I still, I still, I mean, I haven't taught in a classroom for, it's been about, uh, it's been about six years, I think now. So, but I, but I imagine not much has changed. Can you tell you a little anecdote about, um, well, Dan Pink? What yes, Dan Pink yes. Said? Dan Pink said that, you know, if you took someone from the 1950s and put them into a bank today, they wouldn't know what to do, you yeah. know, because they need to have a level of IT knowledge and, uh, they need to know how to use touch screens. Um, often the bank staff will direct you to a touch screen or a, an automatic teller or, or something like that, a technology per se, or direct you to an app on your phone. You know, you go into the bank is like a social space where you're directed to an app or the bank's app, and then they, they will show you how to use that app to, to do the banking you, you want to do. So you become the de facto teller in a way. Similarly, in a supermarket, you know, if you took someone from the 1950s and put them in a, in a you know, self-checkout, they wouldn't know sure. what was going on. Yeah. It would be completely strange. If you took someone from the 1950s and put them in today's classroom, <laughs> 
<laughs> it would look. But then the blackboard's changed yeah, to a whiteboard. Uh, the blackboard is now a whiteboard, <laughs> that, and there may be a data projector, but sure. again, chairs and tables, yeah. um, pictures yeah. on the wall, notice yeah. boards, uh, teacher at the front. Now, the teacher may um, prefer not to do direct instructional methodology but and may rearrange the tables a bit but um, it would be pretty similar, pretty similar to this experience the student and even if the teacher says you know put your mobile phones away yeah. the person from the 1950s would go oh my god you've got mobile phones how fantastic and what you're not allowed to use them yeah how does huh what's yeah. Yeah. So now, um, having said that, you, you have to be mindful of younger learners. Now, there are very good reasons why you would ban mobile phones sure. with under 18 students. But most students in the Alacos space are adults. Sure. Uh, they are, and you are sure. trying to teach them a, a degree of learner autonomy. So getting them to exploit all the possibilities with their mobile devices, and especially materials that you have authored that work on their mobile device, and something they can use outside of the classroom, you can introduce it in the classroom and say, this is a really good thing yes. you can do on the bus yes. to consolidate the learning that we've done today, or at this hour, if you're doing an online lesson, uh, showing them something where they can consolidate that learning um, that feature of language to affect whatever learning outcome you're trying to affect. Um, that's what we didn't have before. That's what we didn't have in the 1950s. We had books and, um, you know, with answer guides in the back. Yeah, it's, it's, um, it, I, it's, na it's, the it's, mobile technology has completely changed the game. Yeah. Where Most you can, people are still using books though, right? Yes, Textbooks yes. Textbooks are still the foundational object All, in the classroom. Although, although I'm, I, I recently, I've been going to Cambodia TESOL for the last uh, almost 10 years now uh -huh. in Phnom Penh. Um, and at first, I noticed that that there was very little mobile technology. Yeah. Uh, people, everything was very paper based. I had to be very careful when I did a presentation at the conference that to make sure I had handouts. Um, sure. The internet was virtually non-existent. Sure. I went last year, and every person has the latest Huawei or Samsung. Ta yeah. You know, not just phone, but phablet, like the combination, the yeah. big screened uh, mobile phone. Everyone, every second person I saw is like, you know, doing their business. Even the lady at the little tiny vendor or the man at the tiny vendor stall had a mob, the, you know, not, not an old one, a new yeah. one. Um, and doing, you know, that was their little business center doing, you, you know, all their business on their phone. Students, I could show, you know, in the plenary, I could look over the shoulder of the students and see they were using their mobile phones. And I was saying, oh, hey, have you tried this app? And they were really appreciative mm -hmm. and they were downloading it. So that was in Cambodia. And the internet was fantastic. It was better than Australia mm. because China has been through and put all the towers up given everyone a mobile phone, mm. it's completely leapfrogged a whole generation of technology to implement the latest mm. technology yeah. um, in the region because China is wanting to be at the forefront of yeah. um, mobile telecommunications. Um, and you can see it. You can see it coming through in a wave with the younger generation. Everything's digital. Yeah. Uh, and people used to say to me, oh, the future is digital. What I say to people, who say that now is no now is digital yeah it's 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 normal it's not new it's yeah can we go back to the classroom i just want to think about what's happening in a classroom because you've got a teacher at the front of the class you've got i believe there are 18 students maximum in australian uh, English. that's a nias um, mandate yes that there right. are 18. and i imagine in, in in countries around the world it'd be far greater number yes. of students i imagine yes. in india for example it could yes. be who knows how many yes so you've got the one teacher at the front of the class um teaching a broadcast lecture um we've got mixed abilities i guess if you were in india you wouldn't have mixed first languages but in australia you've got spanish speakers japanese speakers you name it uh, oh, in India, you have Gujarati, Punjabi, you yeah, have Malayla, uh, a myriad yeah. of languages. English is that's, only one national that's standard. Right. That's right. Yeah. But um, where, where I'm getting at here, and I'm being, I'm being very critical, this, this whole discussion, I'm being very critical because I feel like there is, there is a solution on the horizon for this and it's, and it's just, it, it's going to happen soon. 
whereby students will get personalized learning in the classroom mm -hmm. and it will not come from one teacher mm. because that one teacher at the front of the classroom has no idea how much grammar or vocabulary you have, mm. has very little idea how good your pronunciation is mm. because you get to speak very little in a classroom. Mm. I spoke to Carnegie Mellon University this morning about um, using some of their software that they've mm -hmm. built. Um, they've got a team of 450 researchers working full-time building um, speech recognition technology, mm -hmm. like state-of-the-art stuff. Anyway, she was saying that in a classroom, on average, this is the research that people speak about three times per class. Mm. So, and she said, said that, and, and this is true, that speaking, and you referred to pronunciation before, it's a physiological muscular skill. Correct. It's like playing tennis. Mm. So imagine playing tennis and once a week in your English yes. classroom, you get, you get to hit the ball three times. Correct. How good are you going to get at tennis? That's right. It you're not takes a get, long time. You're not going to get good mm. at tennis doing that. So, you know, some of the solutions here that they've built, which are radical, they've got pronunciation evaluation software now that is on open-ended questions. So you can describe an image mm -hmm. and it will give you feedback on pron, fluency, word stress, grammar, like all the elements, prosodic features of... Of, of spoken speech, so we're sort of we're plugging that into the platform now. Um, so I'm I'm still you know I, I like these idea of language labs and I think they went some way and and I saw a photo from the 1950s of a language lab and it hasn't changed much today mm. but I'm sure the technology can be radically different. Um, let's talk briefly about other modes of delivery. Of course, face to face I believe is is woefully deficient. Um, blended learning and uh, hybrid learning and flipped learning. Do you want to work with me here and sort of define some of these these modes of delivery? Because I think they're sort of ambiguous. Sure. Yeah. Uh, well, the one that I'm most familiar with is blended learning, uh -huh. where some of the course is delivered face-to-face -face and then other components of the course are delivered online. The research behind b blended learning is very popular. Yeah. That is the mode that you get the least attrition. Yeah. Um, fully online, you tend, you know, you you look at your Coursera MOOC kind of analytics, and you get like ten percent completion rates. Yeah. Because it's fully online, and, yeah. and students feel like they're not supported, that there's nobody at the other end. They can't um, self motivate. So it, difficult it to self motivate. Very, I, I've done that yeah. before. I've signed up to a MOOC, being impassioned yes, about a correct. subject. I get. But also, some of the um, video lectures in those MOOCs are so boring. Yes, you get dry. thirty seconds yeah. in, and you think, yeah. "I can't stand this." Yes. Yeah. And and the 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 sad thing about MOOCs is basically a lot of the time they've just transferred a ba a face to face lecture to an online space with actually yeah, that's right. Without thinking of how the learner would actually digest that content, uh, video needs to be short. Um, you know, people aren't going to watch an hour or punctuated, long, or punctuated broken up, uh, scaffolded in some way that a learner is going to be motivated to um, to watch it. Yeah. Uh, and often the way I myself personally have used MOOCs is for just-in-time learning. I've signed up for a, a whole MOOC just to do one module, gotcha. and that's all I wanted. Yeah. And that seems to, that's why it has such a low completion rate is yeah. because people are doing that. They're cherry-picking the just-in-time uh, learning aspects of a MOOC for their own particular professional development yeah. or learning, and uh, that's fine. But in terms of analytics and the success of, of MOOCs per se, it doesn't look good if you've got only a 10% completion rate. Yeah. Going back to blended learning, uh, the reason that blended learning is far more successful is that the the face-to-face -face relationship, yes. and this has been my experience, yes. the actual meeting people in the flesh, setting up, you know, oh, these are the people I'm going to be working with throughout the course yeah. and establishing yeah. that relationship. Then when you do go online, it's not all, you know, is this person really a person or are they a bot or, you know, you never know. Whereas with a, a blended solution, you actually know that that's a real person that you've established a relationship with. And so the online components are much more successful. Yeah. And then the ones uh, that I've seen that are very, very uh, well received by students and very very res uh, successful is there's an opportunity to come back at the end and have another face-to-face -face meeting to, to finish off and then you can discuss the issues you might have had online things that did work th nice. well things that didn't work so the blended space and a lot of um, uh, in particular universities are moving towards that one that I think of that comes to mind is uh, Victoria University that does the block mode mm. they just do one uh, unit 
in four weeks. Right. So blended also refers to using the technology in the classroom as far as I'm aware. It's, mm. Yeah. Which is, yeah, uh, again. Okay. Well, it, it blended or flipped, like um, often um, flipped lessons where you uh, study the content online before the class and you come prepared yeah. for the lesson uh, to discuss what your experience. And that that's kind of the tail end of the blended story. I just told like we've we've done something online yeah. uh, or I've studied some content online, I've done some exercises, I've been involved in a discussion or a wiki or a blog. Um, you're coming back into the classroom to discuss that face to face. So that that's kind of the flipped model or um, and, and that works if all the students have been engaged online. Like if they've gone online before and it hasn't been very engaging, they uh -huh. come to class and well, they don't really know the content and you have to use the class time to teach the content that they should have studied, then it kind of falls apart. So that's one criticism of flipped. Um, but it could go back into blended in that you would perhaps introduce it again. You would have to because they didn't get it online by themselves, you would have to reintroduce it in the classroom. So it really does depend on the quality of your online content and the motivation and often ages of your learners sure. as well. And it strikes me that- And can, proficiencies of your learners. Sure. It strikes me that you can build a blended course, but building a flipped course doesn't make much sense. It would be more like, as mm. you mentioned, a flipped lesson. Okay, yeah, guys, tonight yeah. go home, watch Correct. this, and I'll see you tomorrow. And yeah, we'll flipped, flipped is more a, a teaching strategy. Yes, okay, good. Yeah. It's good, yeah. yeah, because I think people mistook that mm. and they thought, oh, I'm going to build an entire course based mm. on a flipped learning mm. approach. And it's like, well, it seems that the popularity of flipped has died down. It's mm. a, I reckon, um, two years ago, it was like flip, flip, flipped. Mm. Now it's sort of, yes. yeah, it looks like it's a yes. lesson type. Yeah, and it's um, something that you would have in your bag of sure, methodologies. Yeah, uh, because to, you've got to a video use. up your sleeve, and you think That's this is an absolute ripper. It's a bit too yes, long to watch in class. Correct. Yeah. Let's watch it tomorrow, and let's discuss it the next day. Yeah. The next one I want to discuss, which um, we use mm -hmm. at E Two Language, is hybrid learning. And if I may try and define this myself, which is uh, we never see our students face to face, but well, we're, we're mediated through a screen, yes. yes. So we still deliver tutorials, one-on-one, -on -one, real-time, synchronous learning. Um, but they may be sitting in their lounge room mm. in, who knows, Nigeria mm. or, um, you know, Bangalore or somewhere like that. And our teacher may be sitting in, a, in, in their lounge room in, in Melbourne or mm -hmm. London or something like that. So that's hybrid learning. So what we've tried to do is fashion a self-study platform, which we know has self-study platforms in general have low attrition rates. So we've been extremely conscious to think, okay, what are ways in which we can get to push students through this course? And one of the ways that works is there's tutorials, our live classes, and also writing and speaking feedback. So what are your thoughts on the hybrid model? Um, yeah, no, it seems a good model, uh, mainly because uh, of, you know, a lot of people just don't have the time w with the casualization of a lot of the workforce. Now, this can, this is a very interesting space because it's from the teacher perspective, but also from the student perspective, uh, you may get um, teachers who have, uh, you know, other commitments, other jobs, uh, family commitments. Um, like to work the flexible hours that something like the E2 platform offers. It could also be a time of life thing. People are semi-retired and it's very attractive to work from home in that way. Um, so you're getting the motivation from the teachers. Uh, probably, they're probably in some ways, uh, it's a bit of a generalization, but they could be more motivated than a, a classroom teacher because the lessons suit their schedule. Um, and the same from the student's perspective is that the, the convenience and the timing of the lesson could suit what's going on in their lives. They might have part-time jobs or um, other activities that they're involved in where they just can't sit down five hours a day to do their study. Uh, the feedback I've heard from students is they really like um, the video classes because, so, yeah. again, they get to meet um, the teachers, 
um, face to face, even though it's a video format, it's still they're meeting someone in real time. And that seems to be the clincher for online delivery. Yeah. The fact that you can meet the instructor face to face in real time. Yeah. That and that's again where you that you replicate that authentic, real relationship. If you're just watching a recording of the teacher, it's not real. You can it's, pause it. And you, exactly. Uh, but if it, yeah. if it's live, if you're meeting that teacher face to face. Um, through a video hookup technology, uh, and nowadays you get incredibly good, you know, uh, uh, reception bandwidth frequency, uh, where there's no lag, there's no delay, and that seems to have changed uh, that space incredibly. The other thing that students really value is being able to uh, get the feedback uh, to their speaking or their writing. Uh, where they can look at it on their device at their leisure. Mm. Again, you, you're looking at those aspects of, oh, goodness, I remember going to World Expo 88 in Brisbane, Queensland in, yeah, 1988, and that was the theme of the the expo, leisure in the age of technology. Mm. And I thought, oh, this is all silly. You know, this will never happen. This is just a mm. pipe dream. Mm. And now I'm seeing it, you know, leisure in the age of technology and how people are reinventing how they study, how they work. Mobile devices, uh, tablets, phones, etc., yeah. have completely enabled that, um, you know, leisure and uh, work and study all kind of m m merge together That's almost all, or bleed together. Just have you know? hammocks everywhere. Well, exactly. What is leisure? What is study? What is work? <laughs> what is, you know, they've kind of, the, the boundaries have blurred. And it's very interesting. Now, that, that, that World Expo was 30 years ago now. Oh, well, yeah. And yeah. everything they were kind of talking about, they didn't have the top technology then. Then it was still, you know, people are still using VCRs and <laughs> whatnot. Um, but now, yeah. with uh, mobile technology and just that, again, just in time, I can get the feedback at, on my schedule. I can look at it, you know, uh, as long as there's a su sufficiently reasonable turnaround time, like I submit something and it, I get mm. the feedback in, you know, 24, 48 hours or something. Mm. And you have to be explicit about that. Like yeah. if you're doing yeah. any kind yeah, of thing set like that yeah. online, you have to actually say, um, you will get, you know, yeah. there's nothing more frustrating than a learner submitting something and, and then they never see uh -huh. the feedback until months later. That's no good. The, the horse school. is bolted. You need to actually be explicit and say, you will get your feedback in 48 hours. But that's great from a learner perspective because they oh, yeah, that's great. I can go and do other things and I can come back and there it is. And I've got my my feedback, and I can and look at it at my leisure. Yeah. And I think that's the key to a lot of um, online learning now. How does it fit into my schedule? That's right. How can I, you know, break? And how is it broken down in chunks? You know, how is it chunked? And that's great for language learning because language learning was all about chunking, yeah. breaking things down, scaffolding. So technology has enabled chunking. In, in a really innovative way, I believe. Yeah, um, yeah. See, what ours that works. The f the hybrid model works wonderfully for E two language, which is for test preparation, because you have all of these individuals with jobs, you know, working professionals. They think, uh oh, I've got a, an IELTS exam next Saturday, and oh, Thursday afternoon, great, I'll book in a tutorial. One of the more um, audacious things that we're trying to do is do it for general English language mm -hmm. learning and lower level learners, mm. okay? So what we wanna do with E2 School is deliver out some of the best teachers in the world straight from here in our office in Melbourne out to people in anywhere in the world who can have a live class with mm. Alex, for example, or Amber. Mm. Um, and also not just the teacher, but the material that the teacher's working from. Here's one of the things that I have as an ambition. Um, tell me what you think of this. Do you think this would be possible? What I want to do through E2 School is educate somebody from an A1 beginner English mm. language level right up to get them to take an IELTS test and possibly get an IELTS 8. Mm. What are the, what's the likelihood of that, do you think? Well, it's very ambitious. Computer mediated. <laughs> it's very ambitious. However, it reminds me, again, going back in time, getting into a time machine and going back. Uh, when I was in Japan years ago, I... Uh, met a lot of JET, the JET yep, yep. teachers, who would always complain 
that, oh, I just feel like a, a human, yeah. well, I feel like a human tape recorder. Uh, yes. That the whole lesson, the English, and again, big classes of 50 kids in, in, in junior middle, or was it junior high school? Um, the Japanese teacher delivering the lesson mainly in Japanese and then uh, I was just standing there and I was called in to be the human tape recorder. Yeah. To, yeah, exactly, to, to give the example, to demonstrate the example in English. Now, the technology, it, it's still kind of the same model, but the way I'm seeing it is the technology is actually uh, taking your human tape recorder yeah. and giving them a place. So you could still have the, the lesson in, in the, the, you know, the pa part of the world you want to market to, uh, with most of the lesson being delivered in the native language, yeah. but the technology would facilitate uh, not a, a, a human tape recorder, but someone with um, English language uh, knowledge, expertise, uh, methods of delivery that that teacher could access as a resource. Uh -huh. uh, so that that it could work that way, mm -hmm. but you would, especially with lower levels for linguistic consistency, you would need someone a native speaking teacher to facilitate the online class as a resource because yeah. you couldn't with low levels like looking at an A1 I don't see how you could um, hmm working remotely I don't see I might be a bit old-fashioned or not looking at it the right way but I don't see how you could just leave those learners with the online teacher, uh -huh. the, you know, without some intermediary, some yeah. native speaking teacher directing it yeah. and using yes. that that as a resource. Yeah. 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 Uh, and so it's taking, you know, the, the JET program years ago, taking the human tape recorder uh -huh. and actually making that person yeah. center stage. Yeah. And then the native speaker teacher facilitating more and directing in the in the um, native language. Yeah, yeah. We need we're for our level beginner level, for example. We we have to build in translations. I remember I remember looking at a textbook. I was studying Korean. I was living in Korea. I've done this twice actually in two different countries. But I'll talk about Korea. Looking at a textbook that was all in Korean, and I sat in that language classroom for weeks and didn't learn a thing. Mm. Mm. It was just absolute abstraction. Yeah like to the point of absurdity and the teacher mm. speaking to me in Korean. Mm. And, and well, that, 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 um, that was like, yeah. that was it. I walked away with nothing. Yeah. Well, that's always brings me back to Stephen Krashen. And he has, if you go online on YouTube, you can see his great lecture about how language input needs to be, for any learning to take place, it needs to be comprehensible. Yes. So you can't uh, pitch a lesson over the proficiency level of the the students, What's this thing? I plus I one. plus one. It must. But he have, stole that from Vygotsky. Who he did. did the zone yes. of it's it's basically the ZDP. Yes, yeah. that's right. And that's where um, the peer to peer is very important because you establish these um, negotiations of meaning, yeah. where there is a role for the teacher to step in when two learners disagree on uh, the correct form or pronunciation or grammar point. Yeah. Oh, I think it's this. I think it's this. You know, the more proficient, the yeah. the more knowledgeable peer will say. The right thing, and then the less knowledgeable will be a little will think it's right, but not quite sure. And then there's the role for the teacher to step yes. in. So Krashen was great, and I still go go back to Stephen Krashen for that. And the fact that he demonstrated that by doing two lessons, one in which he just spoke German, ah. uh, he did his full lesson in German, and it's a video. And then he said, you know, after it, okay, what? How much le German did you learn zero. from that? And there's zero, of course, because it was all in German, and there was no, yeah. uh, it wasn't situated in any context. It was just spoken language, and of course, the learner is not going to uh, acquire any language because it's not comprehensible. The second version of the 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 lesson he did was he he used um, pictures and uh, drew, and it's something a technique I've always used with younger. I mean, uh, less proficient, lower level students. He drew and he repeated with his drawings all of the features of, I think he was drawing a face with ears and eyes, and people could see it and um, 
uh, locate the language. The language was locatable and mm. contextualized. And Krashen brilliantly showed on a video lesson. Yeah. It was a fully video. The two yeah. modes: the yeah. fully spoken, and then yeah. the one where it was comprehensible, yeah. where he'd used pictures and uh, pointed to parts on his body and uh, repeated verbs while he was doing that. And so you could see uh, it was demonstrated uh, contextually the features of language being situated in their correct context so yeah. that the learner could understand it and acquire it. So I always go back to Crash, and I don't think anyone's really superseded what he did. No, um, that's, you just, know. that's just... It's, I would say that's common sense, but... Mm. Ah, but... Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's, it, it, I, it's I guess interesting. It's, it's so, you know, language... Being a language teacher, when you first start teaching, it is overwhelmingly mm. confusing Very difficult. language itself is just such a mm. phenomenal mm. beast it's of what thing. makes us human Whoa, it's, it's incredibly complex human beings are complex organic which i find yeah. so interesting it's this yeah. organic chaotic structure mm. it's not linear teaching maths it's like cool mm. we've got this trajectory this linear trajectory of teaching this and then this and then this and then this but language it's like uh okay mm. <laughs> there's no starting point no. where do you jump in you can just jump Correct. in anywhere and but yes. it's all branching off and interconnected yes. and well my biggest complex. learning from that and having used a lot of textbooks and particularly in the de direct entry space in um, university preparation programs mm. um, what I found was that there, there was too much language okay that uh, a lot of and this is no one's fault but it just seems to be those intensive programs where there is so much to get through. There are so many uh, features of language that you have to teach in a 12-week period, but students don't need them. Yeah. They're low frequency. Yes, you know, yes, you, yes, I always yes, thought, yes, well, yes, why yes. not just teach them the things they need yeah. and you can reduce it to, you know, the grammar to only the grammar that they need for their faculty study. And it's not as much as you think. And well, this is well, the big learning. Well, yeah. there's freak, there's f we know a lot about frequency of vocabulary. Mm. We know that there's a top 2,000 sure. word list, blah, blah, yep. blah, blah, blah. But there's the frequency of grammar use mm. as well, where the simple present is used, and it's a power law. It's used 80% yes. of the yes. time. Past perfect is used 0 0.01%. Exactly. So why don't do we spend so much it, time teaching a feature of language that they're never going to need, and they won't even remember yeah. when they do need it? I know. I know. It's a, yeah. It, yeah, I know. It's, yeah. It's a wild, wild, complex beast. Um, Tell me more about these pathway programs, because here I, at E2 Language, you know, we're, we're building language le learning technology. That's what we do. But we're quite isolated from, I just sort of get, it, get to peer into what universities are doing. And a few, I visited a few universities and sort of talked to them about, um, you know, using learning base E2 school, mm -hmm. E2 language. And they sort of look at it and they think, oh, my God, that's, the, you know, that's, wow, you've solved the problem of mm. technology and language learning in many respects. But there's still a resistance to using it. Um, tell me what what do these pathway students need then? What what and and how could it be delivered to them better? Um, to my mind, um, what I found pathway students needed in terms of technology was a familiarity with the technology that they would be using in their faculty courses. And there's no easy way around this because. Um, decisions are made about learning management systems and, you know, online textbooks integrated into those learning management systems and ways of teaching and learning uh, that have been decided by university committees, by faculty subcommittees. So the, the, the English language pathway provider is somewhat of a poor cousin yep. and they are very bound by decisions that have been made at the top level. Yeah. Um, and in, at the faculty that the students are, are progressing into. Having said that, my biggest learning from that is you need to make students as familiar as possible with the learning management systems that they were going to be using with the um, courseware that they were going to be using in their business course or their nursing course or their engineering course to set them up so that they would not be disadvantaged and they would have advantage over someone who just came in to the faculty course on, a, on an IELTS score. And that was the feedback I always got from students. Oh, so I'm so glad you taught me you used the LMS or the courseware or some of it in the pathway program because I knew how to I knew how to use it and I could show the 
the people who came in on an IELTS score, they didn't know anything. And I, I and the student, you know, lights up, they're so confident that they could actually demonstrate their technical skill um, in the learning management system or the courseware that the faculty was using. So uh, in terms of a pathway provider, uh, I think that you need to actually um, acculturate. It's an it's an acculturation process. Acculturate the learner to what they're going to be using in their follow up course. So if you can kind of use learning base or E two language in a way that would actually uh, help students transition. You know, it's that transitioning. Um, Right. To can their, I, their high there? level course. So the argument is, and I've heard this before, that, that students need continuity between Moodle in their pathway program mm. and Moodle that they'll use in their undergraduate mm. degree. But does that, I mean, if, if, that's, if that's the strongest argument, I sort of see that as like, I, I'm, I see it as a weak argument because mm. if in the pathway program there's another LMS that is far superior in terms of language learning, Surely the process of learning the new LMS, the Moodle, mm. before they go into undergraduate shouldn't be that long mm. of a process. And if they're spending six months, a semester or two semesters, you know, shouldn't the LMS be one that's built for the facilitation and, and teaching of languages? You know well, what I mean? Well, I, my, I, I get this argument yeah, a, a well, lot. Yeah, well, my I experience think, no, is to, to use both. Right. Uh, so I, the way I used the LMS in the pathway program was somewhat different to the way you know the business fac. Of course, by its very nature, that the way the business faculty would use it. So I was always looking at, oh, what can I? What does the LMS talk to? Yeah. What can I integrate it with? And uh, there you have scope. Why? Why? Why can't you use both? Why can't you have it sitting within the LMS? Yeah, you why can build can't, it as middleware. Yeah. yeah. Uh, why can't it it, it it act as an LTI? And I was that's how I was using the LMS in in the English language okay. uh, direct entry pathway programs. I was integrating as much as I could that was language learning based into the LMS, but I it, I needed to have the LMS there as well for that acculturation process yeah. because every faculty uses the LMS in a different way anyway. Yeah. So. It should be the same in the English language pathway programs that yeah. we would use it. But we and what can I build into it? That's what I was always yeah. looking at. That would help uh, with you know academic word lists, with um, yeah. you know the grammar that they needed, uh, video for yeah. listening comprehension, uh, and in particular um, you know um, uh, mock lectures. Um, that was another big aspect of what we did. We tried to build in as many mock lectures uh, and. Not and from uh, people whose accents were accents other than English, because yeah, yeah, within yeah. Any, uh, you know universities nowadays no, are trying to be international, trying to be inclusive, trying to be in diverse. So yeah. a student from China could have a lecturer from uh, you know Bangladesh. Yes, uh, a student from. Um, you know, uh, South America could have a lecturer from Scotland. Yeah. Uh, so you had to familiarize students with all the cultural backgrounds and yeah. the, the accents of the, the faculty bodies that they were going into. Uh, that was very important as well. So um, I tried to build that into a lot of the listening comprehension as well. And then providing uh, scope for um, uh, in, uh, guided individual learning outside of the class where they mm, could nice. uh, listen to those um, accents. Another project I worked on was using the LMS to actually build a learner strategy. Now this could be some so a way you could integrate uh, your platform, but I used the LMS and other software uh -huh. that I found, you know, op usually open source because we didn't have lots of money, um, but I built a learner strategies website with, mm, that nice. sat within the LMS nice. where we interviewed, we audio recorded students who had progressed into their master's programs, their higher degree levels. We interviewed them and we got them to tell us what their learner strategies were for EAP, what helped them when they eventually got into the faculty. And we broke it down to pronunciation, reading, um, listening comprehension, uh, writing, grammar. We got people from all the student 
backgrounds from Saudi Arabia, from China, from Korea, from Japan. We had an example from every single, because the thing that you will find with learner strategies, not so much English language delivery, but with learner strategies, how to actually learn what strategies, what students will listen to someone from their background yeah. more than sure. from an Aussie, sure. middle-aged Aussie guy. So that was a really big learning and there's a lot of research on that. And, and I go back to um, old papers like the 1975 paper, Joan Rubin, What the Good Language Learner Can Teach Us. Uh -huh. So actually yes. leveraging off uh, and it's not language, it's strategies. Sure. What strategy did, you're a really successful student. What strategies did you sure. use? And th those, those students are happy to tell them, tell yeah. people. So we did, we used the LMS in that way and we used um, other, um, you know, audio software and um, uh, uh, interactive software to consolidate the strategies that uh, they could hear on uh, through the LMS and and the website we created. So in some ways, we were using the LMS as a mini server, uh, yeah, which you nice. can do. Yeah, yeah. Look, I, I reckon university English language centres need to be a bit more courageous, and maybe sort of buck the trend. Perhaps I think those people in those higher positions making those top-down decisions about English language learning need to think a little bit more critically about how language learning is far, di far, far different such a different skill than you know you, other subjects that you study at mm. university well well the thing there is what the the most successful um, universities uh, rely heavily on language and learning advisors mm -hmm. within the course now that that's something that a lot of people and Do it's you mean not in the undergraduate course? in the undergraduate course yeah. correct or postgraduate course now that's something a lot of people don't realize who are not from the English language space is that there is language acquisition, there is also language attrition. So if you have students um, who the only English they get was in their pathway program, they live in a household of other people who speak the same language as them, they were, or they're all Chinese, they work in a Chinese restaurant, the only place they speak and practice and consolidate their English is in the English language classroom and those people go into faculty and the only and and it's reduced the only place they hear English spoken is in their faculty tutorials and lectures and it's content it's not a skill of consolidated their their lang there is language attrition so there you have an opportunity to support those students through uh, like a language and learning advisor you have an opportunity within faculty to offer those students something that will make you know language maintenance, and that's something that I'm seeing that's sadly lacking in undergraduate and postgraduate. It's like, oh yeah, you learnt English in your English, yeah, yeah it's all over now. You speak yeah. English now. Not true. Yes. There is language acquisition, and the flip side of that is language attrition. Use it or lose it. And if their capacity for speaking and consolidating uh, their English language skills is reduced, guess what? Their, their English language skills will, and they will be less successful students. And you know what they do? They go into those essay mills. They go into the essay mills, that's right. Do you know how That's sophisticated right. those yes, websites very. are? <laughs> I, Extremely I sophisticated. One, I saw one yes. the other day that was set up, it was it was set up like a like a, a proper software as a service type of setup where you buy, you know, you buy a dozen essays and get 30% yes, yes. off, you know, 24 hour delivery. Mm. Um, you pay a little bit more if you want a HD. The cheating, the plagiarism that's going on is is radical mm. because of the because of the, the neglect of these international students' mm -hmm. language abilities. Mm. Neglect, and I think I mean it's blown. I was going to say universities are playing with fire. There's been so many spot fires. Mm. You know, SBS writes this report mm. on you know this Chinese student selling this, and, mm. or it's I mean, front it's, page news in you know, the Australian. But they or do nothing. Yeah. They do yeah. nothing. They're yeah. still doing nothing. And the language learning advisors are single individuals. It's not a scalable solution. No. There's some other solutions out there where people get editing help on their essays, but they're not learning the language. Mm. They're just getting somebody to mm. fix their erroneous papers. Mm. Anyway, you can see I feel a bit passionate about this, but yeah. But, but then I think there's scope, scope then, therefore, for students, international students who are studying um, undergraduate and postgraduate 
uh, programs, there is scope for that extra language learning support yes. online. Should, and I should, found the should come with the $30,000 yeah. degree. Uh, but yes, it does You know, doesn't. they should get a, they should, they should get a $20 yeah. log into a yeah. website. In the perfect world, yes. Yeah. But it's, unfortunately, it doesn't. But I found that and f- feedback from students uh, who, who are a bit more um, aware will seek that support out. Sure. And they will pay for it because they see the value of it. And I, and I hope it works for yeah. them. But it's not coming from their, their, no. their content courses. No, no. no, it's not. There may and be one language learning advisor for the whole faculty yeah, and that's and it. And look, they're completely overwhelmed. I, I sat in an undergraduate course. Where I, I lived in Indonesia for a year and studied Indonesian. For, I did the sort of pathway program, if you like. And I studied Indonesian for a semester. <laughs> I reckon I was a bit an A2 level. Mm-hmm maybe B1, and mm. then I'd sat in um, Indonesian courses, like mm-hmm. history lectures, and I did, a, I did a semester at the university, and it was, it was torture. Yes. I, 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 yes. I st- incomprehensible. I st- incomprehensible. Mm. I struggled enormously. Mm. I, I couldn't speak to my peers. I couldn't understand the lecturer. It was mm. embarrassing. It was absolutely embarrassing. So, but, you know, I think the onus is on those who are collecting the fees for those undergraduate courses to provide a mm. proper service. Um, yeah, more value. Um, yeah, uh, because it is a risk to the viability, ongoing viability of those programs is if um, students are not getting, and that's, you see that as well. And it, it plays into the hands of people like Bob Burrell, um, who says, yeah, it's just, he, he calls it out. And, you know, the fact, he pointed to the fact that, you know, uh, Chinese speaking um, accountancy, uh, graduates were being passed over in favour of native speakers who had no qualifications in accountancy, right. purely for the fact that the Chinese graduates did not have yeah. an English language proficiency that yeah. was a professional at a professional enough standard. Um, so you you need to counter that because and you that's can't blame a real the employer for that, you really. can't no, and that that's a real risk to the viability of those programs. Yeah. If that happens, people will see. Well, what's the point of studying yeah. a degree in Australia if you yeah, you're not getting, you know, a proficient, a graduate proficient in English at the end of it, uh, yeah. and proficient in their professional specialization. Yeah. So I, I guess I've uh, grinded my axe the whole way through this conversation about um, what I think is an industry that 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 needs vast improvement, and I think it can only be improved through technology. You know, what we've seen in language testing, for example. Uh, with the introduction of PT Academic, I think is amazing. You know, having um, you know interrater reliability in other tests mm-hmm. is 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 a very problematic area where you're getting your test rated by uh, and piece of writing rated by one person. I think computer algorithms are only going to get better. They they are just only going to get better and better and more precise and more precise. And I think with um, technology and language learning, the thing that I the problem, the two main problems are that we discussed at the start is that uh, the technology being used in the classrooms is not purpose built and as a result it's disparate and as a result teachers are sort of skeptical. Um, my belief is that the first person to come and combine good purpose built language learning technology into a coherent single system uh, is going to win the race, and mm-hmm. I think it's going to be a bit of an Airbnb type of takeover. Mm-hmm. Um, maybe well, it, it, what you want is a disruptor. It's going to be a disruptor yeah. for um, sure. Yeah, and uh, I, I pull no punches in saying that that's what we're trying to do. Um, I'm I'm pretty enthusiastic about doing it because at the end of the day, people who enter those lectures for their undergraduate degree and can't understand the lecturer, that's the person we ought to be caring about here. That really, I mean. I understand the industry's, <laughs> yeah. But um, what's just just as closing remarks? What's your take on the industry? Are you as skeptical uh, or as pessimistic as I am? Oh, I'm always optimistic. Oh, good. I'm a positive. <laughs> I'm a glass half full <laughs> kind of person. I usually and, am. And not only that, I'm I'm interested in things that work, and and I'm I I get I'm in the really fortunate position to. Uh, listen to a lot of face-to-face yeah, right. feedback from students yeah. and what you think they uh, are happy with and what they're actually happy with it can often be too so i have to actually i've actually learned to actually mm. pull back on a lot of my 
prejudices and biases mm-hmm. and actually I've started to listen a lot more and listen quite deeply to what students are saying Very about their experiences. Yeah. Um, and the, the one thing I heard about uh, E2 language was, oh yeah, all that stuff that's on the platform, it's all out there, you know, mm. but you have to do the work. You If you wanted to do it yourself you'd have to go and sift through all the good and bad youtube and That's sift right. through or where the good thing about e2 is that it puts it all in a um you know a well organized digestible uh format in a really good you know engaging uh, digital space so mm. that's the kind of and that's the kind of uh feedback i'm i'm trying to hear uh, you know uh I'm not trying to hear but uh rather i'm i'm attuned to uh students' positive experiences about learning language. Mm. Did they have a positive experience? And not just a fun, not, yeah, yeah. Not a fun experience. So that's why I always say I'm an optimist. I'm always listening for, oh, that really helped you. How did it help you? Can you yeah. give me an example? Oh, it really helped me because, you know, I did the IELTS test 10 times and I always fell down in the speaking component. Mm. My jagged profile was always about speaking because I didn't have the pronunciation mm. I needed to make myself intelligible. Uh, by doing the online program and getting the feedback, the, again, the just-in-time feedback, I really improved my speaking enough to change my IELTS profile or my PTE or mm. whatever, yep. TOEFL, TOEIC. Um, so anything I think that can replicate and to break down that stress for students yeah. in, when they are doing the actual test-taking that can familiarize them because that's the feedback I get from students that makes students happy the fact that they felt themselves and they could see themselves that their language proficiency in a particular skill improved Mm. and that's why I say I'm an optimist because I'm always and how did you do that I'm always asking them I'm Mm. interested how did you do that how did that happen what helped you and that's what we we always ask in NIAS focus groups. How, how give us an example? How do you know that helped you? Mm. What, give us an example. We want to know. We want to, because at the end of the day, uh, if they're paying lots of money, uh, they're spending all this time studying, and at the end of it, their English language proficiency is no different when they started. Yeah, that's bad. That's bad for everybody. For teachers, for students, for language centres, online providers, doesn't matter. Universities. Um, the students are not getting what they paid for, and that's bad. So I'm always looking for, listening for those experiences where students say, oh, because, um, you know, NIAS is really the only organisation in Australia that actually advocates for students. Mm. Uh, we want to know, yeah. are the students getting what they paid for? Yeah. Uh, is it helping them improve? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, because that's the biggest risk. Yeah. is that they pay a lot of money, spend a lot of time, and they don't improve. Absolutely. Uh, that is a ter- for the reputation of Australia, of everybody in the region, uh, that's a big, big risk. Um, so we want to get a good story, a positive story out there about student experiences in Australia. I'm, and I'm sure online. they have wonderful experiences. I think language, learning another language in another country is one mm. of the best things you can do. It's mm. just in- extraordinary. So I have been picking on... Uh, I, I don't think I've been picking the right targets here. W- when we're talking about Australian alocos, we're talking about, I actually did the math on this, 0.000001% of the English language learning population study at alocos schools in Australia. Mm. And we're talking about the exceptionally wealthy people in the world, mm. really. So when I'm sort of um, you know pointing the finger here, I'm, I'm really pointing the finger globally because... Um, Australia is a, a fantastic country to come and learn English in. It's you know one of the best in the world, if not mm. the best in the world. Um, so, but you can imagine the poor quality out there in other countries where there isn't such an emphasis on quality. So. Um, yes and no. I'm because I'm fortunate enough to spend a lot of time in Southeast Asia right. each year. I am seeing. Uh, improvements in quality in the region, region, and you'd be surprised. And bear in mind that a lot of the ELT professionals working now in Southeast Asia uh, have actually studied, they've done their degrees, their applied uh-huh. linguistics, TESOL um, degrees in Australia. Yep. So they've taken advantage of the quality programs in Australia uh, to work in their own countries. 
Um, so I'm every year I'm I go to a lot of um, presentations. I go to a lot of see a lot of research papers. I'm seeing the quality in the region yeah. actually um, improve, and that, a lot of that is to Australia's credit, not just Australia, sure. but other other countries as well. Um, but I'm seeing the so like good quality instruction and language learning outcomes in the region. So it's a case of watch this space. Yeah. I tend to yeah. try not yeah. to judge. Uh, uh, yes, uh, going back to my religious upbringing, okay. uh, Matthew 7, judge not lest ye be judged. <laughs> um, judge away. <laughs> yes, I, I, t- I try to t- I take a step back. I'm yeah, trying yeah, to yeah. be more, and I'm trying to just observe yeah. what is working where. And that changes and because the learners change and, and, and things change. So you have to always be mindful of What's working now, and what what's working now may not may be completely different to what yeah. was working ten years ago. Yeah. So I think it's that not letting yourself, um, uh, you know, ossify. Uh, Sorry, what's ossify? Uh, uh, become a fossil, a uh-huh, bone. Yes, okay. Um, you know, not not let yourself, um, you know, fall behind. Keep up, and that's why I'm so yeah, enthusiastic yeah. about technology because, yeah, me too. and especially special interest groups, people interested in how that's happening. Because you're 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 developing professionally, you're you're getting that little bit better, and at the end of the day, I think that that's a great life lesson, and it's a lesson we try to impart to our students. Doesn't matter where you're at, as long as you're, and don't think about your other student. You know, people are always going to be better and worse than you, but how are you better today yeah. than you were yesterday? Sure. That's, and I think that's a good takeaway yeah. for language learning professionals like teachers, uh, academic managers. Um, sure, maybe last week was a disaster and it didn't work, but uh-huh. don't dwell on it. How can you make it a little bit better? And as long as you're making things a little bit better and you're growing and developing, um, you're doing the right thing uh, yeah. because that's what students are doing and you're reflecting that. You're reflecting each other. Yeah. Um, I'm getting a little bit better as a teacher. You're getting a little bit better as a student. We're growing together. Um, here's some great online stuff that you can take advantage of. Uh, yeah. It'll help. Maybe it'll help you well, in a certain way or maybe it'll help you in a way that I hadn't even considered. Uh, oh, tell me about that. Tell me about that experience. How did it help you? I want to know because then I can use it to help other students. Well, one of the things that we haven't spoken about is the is the teacher's perspective on all of this because we've talked about how difficult it is to learn a language. It's you know phenomenally complex, but to teach mm. a language, you see, what I quickly realised in the classroom was that you're not teaching English. You're a, you're a master of you know seven different mm. disciplines of grammar pronunciation Correct. writing reading yeah. listening speaking punctuate oh my god trying to teach punctuation like that in itself mm. is an art form mm. so you know again the role of technology here is is going to be so helpful for teachers who it's an ex- it can be an extremely anxiety anxious debilitating type of role as well if mm. you're an incompetent english mm. language teacher Correct. which i was for a long time and you know rocking up in front of the classroom they're all looking at you and you don't know your grammar mm. rules or whatever mm. it is. That can be an awful experience. Mm. And so, of course, I think language teachers ought to be you know, develop their professional skills so they can you know, know that stuff. At least you can't know all of it. Mm. It's so, so sophisticated and complex. Mm. But you know, going into a class and letting a piece of AI do a bit of um, pronunciation evaluation instead of you, it, it's... It has to be like this because we I don't think we can train teachers to be that expert in all of those domains of language sure. learning. That is, mm. I think, not impossible. That's radically mm. difficult. Mm. It is difficult, but it's not insurmountable. Um, It'd be amazing if we mm. could, but if you plucked an, an English language teacher out of any school, like how many of them are going to be ex- domain experts in all of those different areas? Like, oh, I think with that, it's good to actually, because you know, you, you're in danger of becoming master of all trades and jack of none. It's good, I've always found, to focus on particular areas um, and also direct, you know, it's all about directing students to um, resources, other people, having the support in place so that you can direct people, you know, even to say, oh, well, I'm not great at teaching grammar, but go and see, yeah. you know, Jackie, she's a, she's a whiz. Yeah. Um, I've always done that. I've always yeah. directed students, go and see these people in the library for referencing, because I'm not great at it. 
um, and acknowledging that in yourself because you can't be all things to all people. So uh, a, a good teacher management strategy is to be able to direct students. Go, go you know, check out this online program. The, you know, go and see this. You see this E two thing. Is it right for you? You know, I'm not an expert in that. Go and see sure. for that. You know, I've always done that with students. I've always directed them. Um, to the expertise that I don't have because you can't, as you say, you can't be across everything all yeah. the time. Um, and having said that, it always brings me back to my very first applied linguistics lecturer when I started my postgraduate diploma, Dr. Robert Kleinsasser, who was a fantastic educator and mm. very memorable lessons. Yeah. And he uh, said he was from uh, the United States and he had a very... Uh, loud, raucous American accent, and he said, well, you know, language teaching is repetition, uh, you know, basically. And I thought, oh, my God, it's right. And he said, how did you learn your first language? Sure. Well, I did it a lot, and I made mistakes, and I got feedback. He said, exactly. So why is it different? Sure. Oh, it's not different. It's repetition. And um, having, you know, and, and, and getting good feedback and uh, good peer-to-peer -peer interaction that produces sites for feedback, I think is the key to it because, you know, it's that uh, cognitive dissidence, you know, that we always want to, you know, we always gravitate to people who think like us, but often we can gravitate to the wrong teachers, you know, if we only ever hang around with people, I suppose you could look at it in a, a kind of assets model with the same set of assets, you'll never get new assets. So if you're always with the same people doing the same thing, you're never going to learn new things. So yeah. the, the good language learner will try to um, have as, and I've seen them, I've had students who've done this, uh, I'm thinking of a particular Japanese student who deliberately took risks and put himself into mm, all sorts yes. of awkward social contexts <laughs> just so he could yeah. learn, so he could get the feedback. Yeah. Of course, not every learner yeah. is like that, but you can encourage students to do sure. that. You can encourage them to take risks, to not always hang around with the same people who speak their language or think yeah. like them. Yeah. Try and put yourself into contexts and situations, as long as it's safe, of course, you never direct a student to an unsafe situation, but try to to have as many experiences as you can, especially while you're in Australia, because yeah. what, what's the point? Yeah. Or even online, try to, you know, try as many things online as you can to get as much experience as you can, because that's where you're going to learn, is by having experiences and getting positive and negative feedback, because, you know, it gets back to benchmarking. How are you compared to other learners? Yeah. It's uh, what we tell the schools. How are you compared to other centers? It's benchmarking. You need to see yeah. who's who in the zoo and how you compare and who you can learn from, you know, who has the assets that you want to make your center better or your language learning better. Yeah. You know, where are the goods? Who has them? I want to be with those people because I can, I can learn from them. Yeah. Uh, I want to buy into a program because it's got that thing I don't have. Um, and it gets back to that basic human, you know, trading, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> transactional, yeah. sounds very, very um, cutthroat, but it's it's what we do. We, 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 we negotiate, we, we trade, we, we do transactions to get the things we want um, to make ourselves more that's, uh, yeah that's that's more than more uh, that's to make ourselves what we can be sure that's you know? why society is so wonderfully advanced mm. if we're all working individually we'd be pretty screwed um thanks very much for the conversation darren i really appreciated it it was um yeah it was really interesting and hopefully people out there listening to it hopefully it sparks some uh cognition some interest in, in what we're talking about yeah cool so yeah thanks again thank you Thanks for listening to E2 Talks. Remember to check out e2language.com for IELTS courses and e2school.com for general English language learning. Thanks. <laughs>